Um, together, we have this sort of process of thinking about how to allow the Red Cross to be more proactive as opposed to reactive. And so when we think about the type of projects that we work on, they're very much um, looking at where the world's going to be in a few years and what kind of funding gaps there are. Um, so if we look at today for humanitarian assistance, it's about uh, $38 billion a year is how much money goes towards humanitarian assistance, but it's still a $30 billion gap. So how do we narrow that? One way we do it is thinking about allocation, and we also think about um, new ways to kind of activate different pools of capital. Um, and so in that regard, uh, we currently have a couple projects. Um, some of you heard today about the Open Libra project that was announced. Uh, and so we're looking at it from a blockchain perspective. Uh, we also look at catastrophe bonds. Catastrophe bonds are essentially an insurance product where we go out and raise $30 million from the private sector. And um, uh, I'm just looking at the clock right now. I just kind of caught my eye. I have what, 13 minutes to talk here until we blow up. Oh, okay, the whole session. Oh, so I will stop talking in 10 seconds. Um, so we have insurance products, which is basically insurance, uh, it's a catastrophe bond. Uh, we're, we're insuring volcanoes. We're also working on community currencies, um, which some of you may have heard earlier that you will be hearing about later. Community currencies essentially allow vulnerable communities around the world to create their own tokens, their own uh, cryptocurrency, and we fund that through our billion dollar in cash transfers. And that essentially um, allows individuals to trade amongst themselves and then with other communities to, to sort of spur growth, resiliency, vulnerability. Uh, currently the project is worth grassroots economics and, and Nick, who's over here, we'll talk a little bit from Sempo. We have about 6,000 people on this on the, uh, the uh, POA sidechain uh, doing about 70,000 transactions. And I think it's about 20 different currencies. So I will leave it there. All right, next up, uh, welcoming Sandra and Nick that collaborated on the project, so it's great to have the technology provider and the, I guess, representative. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra. I'm the Pacific Cash and Livelihoods Lead for Oxfam. Oxfam is a global NGO, a nonprofit present in over 90 countries. We have several use cases active across the organization. Uh, and I'm in charge of the work that focuses on how to leverage the capacities and blockchain technology to assist people in disaster preparedness and response. So I guess I'm gonna focus more on message than what we're actually doing. Uh, you can hear about that right after this if you just stick around. Um, for us, the message is really that one of Oxfam's key missions is to act as a broker and a convener. Connecting local to global, we work across dozens of civil society organizations just in Vanuatu, where I live. Globally, that turns into tens of thousands of community-based organizations and civil society actors. So in that way, we're, com we're community-facing. But what that also means is that we have the capacity to collaborate and connect two field environments where blockchain is still something that is unknown. Um, and where people are still very much disconnected. Hi everyone, um, Nick, I'm the co-founder of SEPO, which is the other organization that was working on this project with Oxfam. And I'm going to resist the temptation to talk about it at all, because I'm going to broke you all into stay. Uh, so SEPO really focuses on creating financial inclusion for underbanked communities around the world. Uh, I think this is a really fascinating aspect of the blockchain space because it's sort of one of those narratives that's been running inside this space since Bitcoin first came out. Everyone was talking about how this is going to equalize finance system analysis. Yet somehow, here we are 10 years afterwards, and the reality is, is that we haven't really seen a lot of this materialize. Um, the reality is, is that Bitcoin did redistribute wealth, but it didn't really redistribute wealth the way we wanted it to. Um, we've got a lot of very rich people and they're not people who are necessarily vulnerable in the first place. Um, and I think one of the problems here is that like, a lot of organizations focusing on the blockchain space don't really focus on the communities that need themselves. It's very easy to get trapped in a bubble of the Western world and try and face problems we have here. So that's what Sempo focuses on. Um, we actually developed a lot of our current platform while working in Lebanon. I'll talk about that more later. But one of the interesting experiences we had over there is we made a vote to Lebanon. We were working with refugee communities. We worked out that 
actually what we were building was totally inappropriate and we threw the entire thing out, which totally sucked. <laughs> but was, I guess, better for it in the long run. Um, one of the interesting things that I think we've learned um, looking at the sort of Bitcoin dichotomy is that Bitcoin really does not work for communities at all. Uh, the second something is a good store of value, it kind of ceases to be good, a good means of transaction. And we're seeing this inside the Bitcoin space. Uh, the more the price of Bitcoin went up, the less people wanted to trade with it because it was suddenly too good to hoard. Um, and so I think this kind of leads us to the conclusion that if we actually really want to create like good impact for communities, we need something that isn't a great portable uh, currency. And there's this great quote by a guy named Silvio Giselle, which I love, which is that uh, a good medium of transfer needs to rush, uh, rot like paper, rust like iron, and evaporate like ether. Um, and even in this case refers to the stuff of like the 1800s. Uh, so it's pretty prescient. And so what we work on, and this is, comes into community currencies and the stuff we're doing um, in country, is really working out how to transform global forms of reserve, um, like Bitcoin, into different forms of currency that are actually useful for communities to use rather than important and just um, creating inequality all over again. I think, so as part of the DevCon Scholars program, I think there's a recognition that there's a massive disconnect between people living in the rest of the world and people who have access to conferences like this. So we're really in the business together of bridging and straddling that disconnect, but also making a concerted effort to break those hierarchies. So if you're interested in learning about how that's actually done, then you should stick around. Thanks. Uh, so I won't say, uh, I guess, too much more, um, but just to re-emphasize the interdisciplinary nature of what we do and the importance of understanding and clearly communicating um, why, why blockchains are an interesting tool for coordination, uh, what they mean for, for groups of people and for society and um, for controlling and governing networks and assets and data and value. Um, we we're fortunate enough to have some really incredible people contribute and we've got videos of the talks but just shout out to Sunova Sandbox who's up the back from IT University of Copenhagen, Kate Diem who just spoke on the main stage, um, a brilliant design ethicist and extend again that invitation to the broader community around um, bringing what you have and your knowledge and expertise and coming humbly to, to learn from people that are maybe a little bit closer to local communities, um, already doing things at scale, or of course people that would call themselves representatives of local communities themselves, uh, to really mature and evolve this blockchain for social benefit idea and um, build better solutions that are, that are more meaningful and, and helpful and enable that choice, which is why we all started. So thank you so much, and with that, I'll allow the next presentation to prepare themselves. And thank you for your attention. Feel free to approach anyone that you've seen or ask any questions uh, to continue. I also encourage you to uh, turn your attention to Open Libra, which was just announced as kind of an open source uh, effort to respond to Libra and collaborate around uh, Facebook's Libra uh, in terms of um, in terms of building a network which creates governance where people can actually influence and participate the decisions that are made. So that's something else really interesting that connects to this. So thanks again and please stick around for the next one. <coughs>